Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the March Marin Economic Briefing. My name is Mike Blakely, and I am the CEO of the Marin Economic Forum. We are a nonprofit organization providing research and advisory on the Marin County and Bay Area economy. You can find out more about our work and lots of the great uh, activities and reports that we've done by visiting our website at marineconomicforum.org. You can also make sure to subscribe to all of our communications to make sure that you get invites to this and other events that we host. So welcome to the month of March briefing. A lot of things happening in the Maroon economy. Just last week, we held elections. And one of the themes that came out of that uh, election was that voters are in not much of a mood to be spending more money. Uh, measure A, which was a major school bond, appears headed for failure. Uh, residents of San Salmo looks like they have elected to move out of a mandatory flood fee. And this all sets up as very interesting as we look at larger Bay Area region-wide bonds that are being prepared right now in the transportation sector and in the housing sector. So this idea of tax fatigue has been discussed before. Um, we started to see some evidence of that last week. During the weekend, uh, I don't know about you, but I noticed a lot more real estate signs popping up in the residential real estate market. We're entering that very important spring selling season. So we'll see, uh, get some, get a good idea on what's going to happen in the housing market with very high mortgage rates, uh, but also very limited supply. Uh, we'll see over the next couple of months how the Marin residential real estate market is going to shake out. And as I look outside now and I see blue skies, it reminds me that summer is not that far away. And during summer is an important tourism season for Marin County's economy. So we'll start to see people making their plans for the summer. Hopefully that includes a lot of people coming here to Marin and enjoying our restaurants and hotels and all the other amenities that we have here. So we're going to turn now to the national picture. Uh, and joining us, as usual, is MEF's chief economist, Dr. Rob Eiler. Rob's going to go through some of the key indicators that are out there uh, so we can look at what's happening at the national, state, and local level. And then, as usual, I'll come back and talk with you all a little bit about what Marin Economic Forum is focused on right now. So, Rob, good morning and over to you. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, folks. Thanks for making the time to... Uh sit around with us for a bit and see uh, what's going on in the economy. What I want to start with is I want to start with the labor market. Our labor numbers for the U.S. continue to rise. And I always compare, at least in, since COVID, to what happened in the Great Recession because we had such a sharp decline as a result of the pandemic that we want to see kind of where we are on that recovery and ultimately expansion window vis-a-vis -vis where we were in the last recession and ultimate recovery and then ultimate expansion. The blue line on this graph starts in November 2007 with the number of people working in the United States equal to 100. It took 78 months to get back to that number. This is where we are as of February, at least in the latest estimates that came out last Friday. We're 3.8% above where we started in January 2020 on a seasonally adjusted basis. And we've been growing basically over the last 20 plus months. So in terms of recover, in terms of expanding the number of people uh, beyond where we were in January 2020. So as that black line continues to rise up, one of the things that concerns policymakers is will we have complete relief from inflation with the idea that the more income that people are making, the more spending they're doing based on those, in, on those incomes, and then ultimately the job market really not providing much spending relief would ultimately keep inflation somewhat higher than the Federal Reserve wants it to be. However, this is also keeping us from a declared recession so that that nasty balancing act that policymakers try to try to find is continuing to, to baffle some forecasters, and we'll see some of that in just a minute. But the bottom line is our labor markets continue to show resilience, and, and off we go. Now, in terms of prices, this is where inflation is as uh, as of last month, or as of sorry, as of January 2024. But it's inflation through a very specific lens. So the Federal Reserve is watching what's called core personal consumption expenditures prices. And that is everything we buy at home, less food and energy products and services with the idea that what remains is the core. And what that January 2.8% suggests is that compared to January 2023, all the stuff we buy at home is 2.8% on average more expensive than it was one year ago. So while that is lower, and you can see the evolution of this, uh, the, the, the inflation rate with that specific price index 
since January 2007, very slow, low inflation for most of the 2010s, then this real wild spike that took place after the pandemic shadow started to slowly fade, and then interest rates went up to sort of knock it back down, and we've been on that journey ever since the, in the interest rates started to go up in earnest. And 2.8%, it feels like that that's slower inflation. The problem is that is compounding what we've seen over the last couple of years. So prices are not shrinking, they're just rising at a slower pace. And it's still a relatively high pace. If you look at the last 15 or 16 years in a row, you can see that sort of historic window looking backward, inflation still relatively high. So the Federal Reserve's got to think about if the jobs market still putting pressure on prices to rise or at least support at a relatively high inflation rate, what does that mean for interest rates? And is the job we've tried to do in knocking inflation down truly over? Well, if the forecast plays out, that shaded area is basically the forecast or those red dots within that shaded area is the forecast the Federal Reserve is looking at to see whether or not that solid blue line moves through those red dots toward that blue dotted line, where the blue dotted line is reflective of where the Federal Reserve wants inflation to be. So when it's thinking about setting interest rates, it's thinking about how can I, how can we as policymakers shape spending and business investment behavior in such a way to kind of weave the blue solid line around that blue dotted line on average. And we have been way away from it for a really long period of time. And so that's why interest rates have not started to fall yet. But we are watching when rates fall, how far will they go down and why are they falling? So if that blue solid line is not moving in earnest through those red dots or more completely toward the blue dotted line, rates will probably fall at a very slow pace. But of course, the financial markets, if you've been watching financial markets, part of this sort of you know quick rise we've seen since January 1 and really starting before the beginning of the year in equity markets, some of that is a bet on how interest rates are going to move over the next few years and that uh, investors in equity markets are going to provide or be provided some rewards as a result of those rates falling. So we're watching that and then we're going to watch very closely how equity markets start to react to whether or not the Federal Reserve's movement in rates are then transmitting themselves through other interest rates and in general playing out the bets that equity markets have made. Then we're going to talk about soft landing if we see those rates start to fall, because the supposition is, is that the Federal Reserve feels like it's done its job and it needs to now alleviate some of that rate pressure. When it does so, it will sort of say, okay, guys, the job we wanted to do is over. And that means we basically have woven together a, a story here where jobs were not lost in earnest and inflation came back down again. So our job is now starting to end. And what's that soft landing look like? It looks like probably that we're going to have a slower movement in the next couple of years, that we're going to have to pay for some of that cost based on higher interest rates uh, with bit slower business investment, which means a slower moving economy. So if you look at the forecast, this forecast is from February 2024. Every quarter, the Federal Reserve in Philadelphia, it's the branch there, uh, surveys 40 forecasters, and this is called the Survey of Professional Forecasters, and asks them about a bunch of different macroeconomic variables. And I pull three of those out of that, that survey, specifically real GDP percentage. You're thinking about this as the percentage change in incomes generated in the United States that stay home uh, after inflation. So it's real, what we keep uh, after inflation, the unemployment rate, and then that same core PCE inflation we saw before when we looked at prices. That shaded area is the latest forecast. It's sister data to the left, what's under previous, is what happened the previous quarter. And you can see for 2024, that really jumped. So when you hear about a soft landing, part of that is having growth rise up and be farther away from zero or farther away from so-called technical recession. And we're seeing that throughout the next few years in terms of the forecast. So nothing there is really moving towards zero in earnest, nothing really moving toward three or four or 5% either in earnest. So we're in this sort of slow, steady growth pattern We've got to pay for some of the higher rates and some of the higher inflation in some ways. And part of that's just going to be a slower growth pattern. But the cool thing is, is we don't have recession anywhere in this forecast. And, and you've actually started to see some folks out there that were forecasting recession starting to fade a little bit on the probability of it happening in, 24, in 2024 or 2025. Which, and then after that, our vision as economists gets very foggy in terms of our forecasting ability. The labor market looks like it's still going to have a lot of heat in it. And looking at the unemployment rate alone is a little dangerous. But the bottom line is, is that if you think about the evolution of the unemployment rate, you can see that for 2024, these forecasters have actually faded that uh, forecast they had last quarter. And that's also the same for 2025 with a little bit of a pickup. But almost every major economy on planet Earth would take those unemployment numbers any day of the week over the next three or four years. And so 
It looks like we're not going to have a large amount of unemployment that was first predicted when interest rates went up, nor are we going to have, uh, let's say, a push back down toward historic lows. It's, it's going to find some balance point very similar to what we saw basically in the years 2015 through 2019 before the pandemic really seized up our economy in terms of our social choices. And then there's those same red dots we saw before, the slow fade over the next couple of years toward that blue dotted line or to 2% on an annualized basis. So the American consumer has provided a lot of recent boost to the economy. The third and fourth quarters of 2023 beat almost every single forecast out there in terms of how strong those quarters were. And a lot of it was driven by consumers. So if you think about where the growth numbers here on this forecast are coming from, if interest rates are going to fade, let's say in the third and fourth quarter in some earnest in 2024, that should provide continued resilience to consumers and potentially to businesses in making investment. And Mike alluded to the housing market. We might see a little bit more of a boost in the housing market. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But the bottom line is we've been able to kind of move through this period and it looks like recession is less likely as 2024 and 2025 start to look more uh, or start to have a little clearer vision about where we're going as an economy over the next couple of years. If we look at the California labor market numbers and just sort of switching to the state and the regional level real quick, uh, this kind of is a perplexing story. So that blue line is the evolution of the labor force in a seasonally adjusted terms over the last 14 years. So if you look at those data, you can see we had this very slow climb in the number of people that were living in California and either looking for work or have a job somewhere. And that peaked right before the pandemic, would cut pretty sharply in terms of labor force numbers, wobbled around and has still not gotten back for the state of California to the number it was before the pandemic. Now, we know that we've had people leave California. We know we've had people leave Marin County and the Bay Area in general in terms of outbound migration. What is more tricky to understand are the next two numbers. So it is hard to find a time in California's economic history in which we've had basically no jobs growth without a declared recession in the United States uh, for, let's say, more than, let's say, two or three or four months. But we've actually had that situation now for almost 18 months. And so the orange line is the portion of the blue line or the portion of the area underneath the blue line that is the number of people that have a job that live in California and are workers. You can see that knock way down during the, uh, the pandemic. So looking left to right, slow, steady growth, closing the unemployment gap, or let's say closing the number of people unemployed, that difference between the blue and the orange is the number of unemployed, real sharp cut, started to come back pretty good for about 24 months and then flat basically for the last 16 or 18 months. It is hard to find zero growth in California's economy for people that live in California and are looking for work. That's now happened for a really long period of time. So it's, it's somewhat of a conundrum because the next stop is the number of people who work for a California-based employer regardless of where they live. And that has continued to grow and has gone beyond the pandemic benchmark, which you can see the black line, slow, steady growth, basically following the growth of employed Californians, sharp cut, similar, growth similar, but then has continued to climb up while the orange line has flattened. That means we're hiring people who have either moved away from California or live outside of California on average. And that's changed the dynamics of the California labor market. That space between the black and the orange is now closed. If you go back to the dawn of time in California, that never even got close to closing. If you look at Marin County, the labor data are being updated. So what I have for you today is just looking at the people who are employed by Marin-based employers. And I want to show you this evolution vis-a-vis -vis after seasonal adjustments to California. So that is the evolution of Marin County as the blue line and the black line is California. And you can see that for Marin County, the growth was a little slower over the 2010s. The cut was very similar. But in fact, growth has started to pick up a little bit in terms of people that are hired by Marin County-based employers. So the economic development efforts of organizations like Marin Economic Forum and just the county in general as a place to work has started to pick up a little bit. Though when the labor data are corrected and, and uh, sent out again in a couple of weeks, the same dynamic is basically happening in Marin County is at the state level. So in many ways, what the Federal Reserve was trying to do was slowing down the economy. California experienced that slowdown more completely than other states in the United States. And part of that's because we hired in California from outside the state of California. And that's also true to a certain extent for Marin County. However, we've seen a pickup in Marin County's employers, which means that we're 
Marin County's uh, businesses are started to pick up in terms of income and it's sort of, again, moving through this period in which rates are relatively higher and soft landing and just moving forward at a pretty good pace. So it's good to see that. If you look across the industries in Marin County and we think of just the last year. So Mike and I have talked a little bit about sort of leaving the pandemic behind and we're starting that transition in, in earnest here in 2024. This is last year. So that corroborates the story I just told you that Marin County's employers have picked up. It's almost across every single industry where we've seen jobs growth. The ones that have not seen as much growth is in retail, financial activities, which includes banks, credit unions, insurance, real estate to a certain extent, and the professional and business services will be legal, accounting, engineering, architecture. Those are, are slightly slower, but otherwise pretty robust growth in terms of the last year, given all the change in interest rates, all the continued lingering effects of inflation, all the political, geopolitical uncertainty, hiring has continued in Marin County, like I said, pretty much across the board. Now, the housing market, just to show you some, some contrasts, what I'm going to start with is what happened last year in terms of the change in median prices across California in specific places. So Marin County went up by about 1.2% over the year at the median. The at Sonoma County went up about 2.2%. San Francisco went down again. So San Francisco is really not completely emerged from the pandemic shadow in terms of its housing market. But for most of the places we show here, uh, the larger markets in California saw some, a little faster comeback than the Bay Area generally, or specifically the North Bay. But you can see that that's last year. Now, why that's important is that, and Mike kind of alluded to this, we're starting to see some more uh, existing units come online. Part of that is a supposition interest rates will start to, to come down or at least moderate a little bit to where people are not going to look at the cost of credit as an impediment to demanding a housing unit if it comes online. And those that want to now start taking profits from that are, are looking to do that. It's been four years basically since the pandemic started. So this is the four year run. And this is another thing to think about if this is accelerating the thought pattern of homeowners that is it now time to start taking those profits off the table because those four years went really quickly. And you can see places like San Diego, Riverside County had over 50% growth in median home price over the last four years. So if you had purchased in 2019, you generated another 50% basically on your home as of the beginning of 2024, that's going to give you a lot of profit motive to potentially put that existing unit up. And it's still though a very slow movement of existing inventory coming on market. So it'll be very intriguing to see how this plays out in terms of people actually profit taking. However, the current forecast that's out there, in, in turn, this is Zillow's forecast with its public database, is pretty, I wouldn't say mediocre, but is sure better than a lot of negative numbers that we had maybe eight months ago, but not much growth. So if you look at the data here, you'd say, okay, well, if they're motivated to sell, why aren't we seeing a little bit of a pickup? Interest rates are still going to be relatively high. They're not going to go shooting back down to 3%, 3.5% for a 30-year mortgage. People are still going to be on the on the margin saying, wow, do I really want to make the jump to a, a, a relatively high interest rate or not? So slow, steady growth where demand and supply are basically in balance, a little bit more demand than supply. That's why those blue columns are above the red dotted line. But if you look at the far right hand side, there are some uh, relatively close counties that are still struggling a little bit. Marin County basically flat as a pancake, at least in the terms of the latest forecast. But Mendocino County, Humboldt County, Lake County, San Francisco, all negative for now. So there are some parts of the North Bay and of the Bay Area that still are not showing a lot of demand pressure versus supply. And so Marin County is not necessarily uh, like that, even though the forecast for now is very flat. We'll watch very closely to see whether or not that's an inventory issue versus a demand issue over the next five or six months. So to wrap up some of the issues to watch before I hand it over to Mike. Interest rates and equity markets, I talked about that before. As interest rates start to fall, our equity market's going to react in such a way that say, okay, the bets we've made are now paying off. Our jobs market's going to continue to fall in terms of, I'm sorry, are going to start to slow down a little bit. Uh, in California, we really need those resident employees to start picking back up again. It, it, that tells a tale of why migration is changing the nature of how we find workers in California. And for local businesses that need local hiring, that job that worker search continues to be very tough and very costly. We're watching closely, Mike alluded to this, how elections are going to affect the way that businesses not only invest, but potentially hire. If you watch the president's State of the Union address, he talked about how the economy 
has really flourished under his his uh, administration. And you always have to take those numbers with a grain of salt, no matter who the president is, because it's not necessarily the president's office that's generating those changes. Uh, but at the end of the day, how the business, how businesses view the elections, regardless of who gets in the White House, will start to emerge September, October. And the more contested and the more uncertain the outcome of the presidential election, as well as the congressional elections we're looking at, become the less likely that businesses are going to make investment looking too far ahead because they just don't know in what environment they're going into. And you stack on top of that the geopolitical issues. And I just put something here because now Ramadan has started. There was a lot of talk about having a ceasefire agreement in Gaza before Ramadan began. What would that do to business confidence if we actually saw a ceasefire there? Would that boost markets? Would that boost investment with the idea that that would start to slow down all that pressure in the Middle East? If you've been watching gas prices, gas prices have clicked up a little bit for three major reasons. One, we're going into the American driving season. Two, there's a lot of threat on supply coming out of the Middle East, and the continued issues in Ukraine is all, are also sort of shaking up global oil markets uh, based on what is happening also in Europe with respect to their want to demand oil and where they're going to find it. So all that stuff can affect the way that businesses look forward, and a ceasefire in, in Gaza would probably do a little bit of tr strong positivity for a bunch of different reasons. Commercial real estate remains a threat. we got to be watching this. There's a lot of rhetoric coming out that we're turning a corner. We will see if that actually takes place. And then Mike alluded to this too, that we're going to be watching the travel season closely to see if Marin County can kind of keep the momentum going. The last couple of years have been really a great time for Marin County's hotels, restaurants, and sort of the, the other industries that welcome and, and assist and serve visitors we need to keep that momentum going. Mike and I have been talking about this for years, that that's an opportunity of millions of people that go up and down Highway 101 on a daily, much less weekly basis, capturing some of that market. Marin County started to do that in, in earnest, which is great to see. We will see if we have a better 2024 again. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Mike. Thank you again. Thanks very much, Rob. A lot to um, unpack there. And um, as always, for our uh, participants, this presentation will be uh, emailed to you as uh, including a recording of this in case you didn't catch all of that stuff. So I want to take uh, a few moments with the time we have left to talk a little bit about uh, the idea of business attraction. So since the last time we all gathered, uh, Marin Economic Forum held its annual event, which is called Forecast in the Future. Thank you to those of you who attended. In this event, we not only present uh, Dr. Eiler's forecast for the year, but we also choose one theme to sort of focus on. And this year, we focus on the theme of business attraction, which is one of two priority focus areas for Marin Economic Forum this year, along with workforce development. So what I wanted to do with a few minutes we have left is talk a little bit about why we are focusing on business attraction and why it's something that's important for Marin County. And I would have to think that if you're tuning into this program, you already have some type of understanding of what that may be. But really, we look at this as a problem solver. Um, business attraction is, for most of you uh, who don't know, is really when a public entity goes out and tries to actively recruit companies to locate in their region. Um, that has not ever really occurred in Marin County uh, at a countywide level. Some cities have promoted themselves, but not really to the extent that we're used to seeing. But why it's more important now is there's a few things, a few issues in our economy that aren't often discussed, uh, but really could be solved by having more businesses locate in Marin County. And as we saw coming during and coming out of the pandemic, this flight to the suburbs to conduct business is actually a real thing. And that remains an opportunity for Marin County. So again, we look at it from the perspective of, well, what issues would that be solving if we had more businesses uh, to locate in Marin County? And there's a few things that I'd like to just touch on. So if you look from a strictly economic perspective, you look at the data, you'll see that there's sort of an overweighting of personal services companies in Marin County. So from one perspective, as a resident, that's great. You've got a lot of choices for restaurants or other access to goods and services. But from a strictly economic perspective, it's not good because that means that you don't have what's considered a resilient economy. And as we saw during COVID, if you shut something down for and your market is local, you're going to lose business and you're going to lose jobs. If you have a natural disaster, which thankfully we haven't had, but we've had things like flooding and, and, uh, and other things or even power shutdowns, these are all disruptions that can really affect the business sector 
if your dependency is on a local market. So we need to see more companies locating and growing in Marin that are going to serve markets outside of Marin, whether that be just regionally, nationally, or even internationally. We have some of that now, but we could definitely use more of it to make sure that we can insulate ourselves from any type of disruption. Second, as most people know, we have a highly educated population here, a lot of um, skills holding jobs in some of the most advanced sectors in the world, whether that be biotech or technology, financial services. Uh, but we don't have enough of those jobs to satisfy the residents that have those skills, meaning people have to look outside of Marin County for employment. That's become a little bit easier with the rise of remote work, but still we need to have those types of jobs here to not only provide our residents that have those high skills, but also to provide what we call a career ladder, letting people know that if they invest in getting a job and skills here in Marin County, they can continue to move up the career and economic ladder, utilizing those skills with jobs in Marin County instead of out. And then finally, we are seeing very nascent activity in terms of the uh, startup ecosystem here. We're start we're seeing some more companies uh, start and locate in Marin that are that are serving those international markets that are looking at sort of a fast growth type model. We definitely need more of those. Um, I see a question about the aging population. One of the reasons we need more of these growth type companies is because we do have an aging population that is not only gonna be exiting some jobs and putting maybe more pressure there, um, but also we're having a hard time attracting youth to move here and to make sure that our economy stays robust with both consumers and labor force. Um, and so one of the things that business attraction can solve is making Marin maybe a more desirable place for a younger family to look to move, not just for the quality of life or the schools, but also for the job prospects. So if this sounds like something that you agree with, and if you would like to somehow be involved in our efforts here, I encourage you to go to our website. We do have a, a new partner program that we put in place last year. This is an opportunity for all kinds of organizations, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a private business, to get involved in the work that we do. Uh, again, the two themes that we're going to be focused on this year is business attraction and workforce development. These are two things that almost every business faces in Marin County. We know that. Um, and so we're going to be gathering our partners together and meeting frequently and talking about the types of solutions to these issues. So with that, I want to thank Rob Eiler. I believe the questions that we have in the chat have been answered. Is that right, Rob? No, Mike. In fact, I can just address a couple of these real quick. Robert asked about uh, addressing the fact that workers cannot afford to live here. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at it from a worker perspective, that's not a new issue for the North Bay, but it does drive a bit of the migration that takes place. So if you look at the forecast for rents for median home price, uh, for the general cost of living, there's very little relief in sight for the Bay Area, much less the North Bay. Uh, and so that's that's a, a, a game of relief that you're going to watch play out in city councils and boards of supervisors in terms of how many, uh, quote unquote, affordable houses are built, where they are, and how much they're targeting workforce versus just simple residents, regardless of what their work pattern is going to be. But that relief is really not coming. And that then exacerbates pressure on wages and the cost of finding workers and ultimately the cost of doing business, especially for our smaller businesses. And almost every small business I talk to laments that issue in terms of it being a part of the equation that people are looking at with respect to where they live and how much they're asking for in a wage. In terms of the aging population, so Kevin asked about this. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that Marin County's population is projected to age uh, more. This is true for Sonoma and Napa counties as well. The Bay Area has provided some younger relief to Mike's point before attracting a younger audience to Marin County or closer to Marin businesses is, is going to be a really good thing if it can be pulled off over the next four or five years and just providing more worker choice for local businesses. Uh, but if you think about the projections and kind of really the last five or six years, the population growth here is probably going to be relatively slow. It's going to continue to attract um, an, an older, more affluent resident. Uh, and it means that we're going to have a little bit more pressure on aging. Hope is that can slow down and we can get some working families that formed families at a little long, a little uh, older age. And if that can happen, we might see more kids and we might see then thus more younger workers come to Marin County and the North Bay. But we, we should not expect 
there to be some panacea or some magic wand that sort of rids ourselves of housing shortages, homelessness, or some of the other things that you're talking about in your question. Uh, th those things really, in my mind, are solved by the nexus of having really good housing policy and really strong workforce and economic development working in, in concert with each other in such a way to solve problems. We will see how that goes. And, and there's Marin County is still going to be a place for entrepreneurship. Uh, the hope is it also is a place that young families want to come and live and then and have a job here and that those two or those two major ideas work again together. Yeah, but Mike, that's, that's all we got. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Rob. That's, that's well said. Um, and again, we are at time and it's always my goal to get you on with your day. So I want to thank everybody for joining. Again, we'll have uh, this recording and the slide deck sent out to you. Please tell your friends. Uh, we try to make this the most impactful 30 minutes that we can um, and keep you guys uh, posted on what we're seeing and informed on what the economy is doing here. Um, and so with that, we'd like to wish you a good week and thank you again for tuning in and please visit the website for any more information. Have a good day, everybody.